Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I am Amir Oren, filling in for Jonathan Hessen, who will be back uh, next week. In a few days' time, on the 15th of uh, this month, Lebanese voters will elect a new parliament. The 128 seats are allocated along confessional and geographical lines, with no party ever getting a majority and the government uh, does uh, needing to be based uh, on complex uh, coalitions. Lebanon is in a permanent crisis economically and socially, and this time around, it is perhaps um, even more than ever dependent on outside uh, forces such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, and to some extent uh, Israel too, because of Hezbollah's influence on politics. Hezbollah, of course, being not only the Shiite uh, movement and militia, but also a party represented in uh, parliament. So to explore the issues uh, before the Lebanese electorate uh, ahead of the elections, we have a retired colonel, another doctor, and a retired colonel who is also a doctor. So that would uh, uh, bring us uh, full circle. Uh, with me in the studio is uh, Reuven Ben Shalom, retired colonel, and uh, an expert on cross-cultural phenomena. And uh, with us uh, in other locations uh, in Israel are retired colonel Dr. Jacques Neria, a former intelligence officer and an advisor to the late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, also um, being born and educated uh, in Lebanon, not only an academic expert on the country, but uh, having deep roots there. Hello, Jacques. Hello. And Dr. Uh, Nir Bombs, uh, not only an expert on the region, but also in close contact with many personalities and groups from throughout uh, the area. Welcome. Good to be here. Jacques, uh, let me uh, uh, turn to you, because had you stayed there, you could have voted um, in this uh, election. Is there any prospect of Lebanon coming out of its uh, constant crisis after mid-May? Well, first of all, allow me to say that uh, if I had the chance to the, to to vote in Lebanon, I would I would have done it. But unfortunately, the 50 years ago, I left the country, and uh, this is this is past. This is past and uh, forgotten. Anyway, but what what you're asking is a very uh, tricky question because, in my view, this uh, the coming elections will be the most violent elections they ever had in Lebanon, and certainly the, they they are meant to define the identity of Lebanon in the next future, whether it is going to be a country under Iranian hegemony or whether it's a country that will keep its independence and its Arab uh, attitude. Uh, basically, this is what uh, what is at stake today. Where, where is Lebanon going to? And uh, in my view, the coming elections are a, a very big question mark. And uh, certainly the outcome of it is not very clear. So if you're looking for a safe haven, this is not going to be the, the, the case. Reuven Ben Shalom, um, you have a lot of experience um, in the military. You've probably flown over Lebanon or into it. Um, it is not uh, uh, really fair to blame Hezbollah for all of Lebanon's problems. Uh, the uh, movement has been created uh, by the Iranians 40 years ago. And as we know, the, the problems there uh, long preceded that, including the uh, civil war of the uh, 1970s. Let me pose a devil's advocate question. Is Hezbollah the problem or the solution? Um, perhaps Hezbollah as, um, as a stabilizing uh, force uh, could be Israel's interlocutor. Perhaps Israel could get some sort of um, a modus vivendi with it. Well, Lebanon is a troubled and complicated place. And I, I wouldn't discuss if Lebanon, if Hezbollah is the problem. 
Uh, it is a problem, of course, not a problem only for Israel, but a problem for the state of Lebanon because it, it does destabilize the situation. It uses Israel as an excuse because it's always easy to have this external uh, enemy that you have to protect. They have to be the protectors of Lebanon against this, uh, this evil entity, even though we want nothing with Lebanon. But certainly you're right that uh, the problems do not start with Hezbollah. In a way, Hezbollah was born out of the troubles of Lebanon. It, Lebanon is a unique place, uh, we're very, very vibrant, uh, different peoples coming together. And for many years, you know, there are internal clashes, a 15-year civil war. Uh, I myself was born in the States. Some countries go through a civil war to, in order to forge their identity. Sometimes it brings to good things. Sometimes the clashes go on and on. I hope we're not going to another civil war. But, but certainly we have to look back at history, look at the last 100 years, this beautiful country, Lebanon. It's, I say it's beautiful because I saw it from above, yes, but also the interesting, diverse people inside and the way they struggle. In a way, I admire the Lebanese people of how they held it together and they are trying. They are trying and they have this interesting mechanism of how to make it work. Uh, the fact that it's not falling totally apart is in a way a miracle, okay? But the next future, uh, the coming up, upcoming elections, I don't know where it's going to go. Troubling times, especially now that the situation and the economy has crumbled. Uh, Dr. Bombs, um, you're one of Israel's uh, most knowledgeable experts on Syria. And uh, Lebanon, of course, uh, was uh, given its independence first as part of Syria and then of Syria um, by the French, and the Syrians um, held uh, tight control over Lebanese affairs uh, for many years. They uh, re-entered Lebanon in 1975-76, and then only left it uh, 30 years uh, later after um, uh, the Hariri uh, assassination. Um, is it a good thing that um, there is no uh, control of Beirut from Damascus? And how come Syria is now absent from this uh, deadly game? Well, Amir, Syria is absent uh, from itself. Uh, if you spoke about uh, Lebanon, a country in bankruptcy in some places, uh, when you speak about the elections, one of the actual problems is when you have only two hours of electricity, in many uh, locations, how can you actually get uh, electronic ballots uh, in order? And, and that's going to be one of the issues uh, uh, that will influence Lebanon. And if you can now jump to Syria, uh, you have a very uh, similar situation. And when a country hardly is able to control uh, itself uh, with Turkish occupation uh, in the north, uh, with uh, still pockets of uh, rebels, with uh, struggles between Russians and Iranians uh, on its soil, with uh, Israel's activity there, it's difficult uh, uh, to uh, assert influence outside. Um, and that uh, has been the case. The main problem is that following the withdrawal from uh, Lebanon or the second withdrawal from uh, Lebanon uh, as a part uh, uh, of, of the events uh, uh, leading uh, uh, Hariri assassination, as you said, and then afterwards uh, Syria was, was busy with the war, the people who have taken their place at the Beirut airport uh, were Hezbollah. So we have uh, received uh, another type uh, of an influence that is not, uh, uh, was not constructive, uh, uh, not from Israel's perspective, and also not from the perspective of Lebanon. Uh, so Syria is, is not a major factor here, mainly because it's too weak uh, to assert uh, influence. Iran still is uh, very much uh, in uh, the game. Um, and whether these elections uh, will be able to change something within uh, the blocks, uh, uh, that will be interesting to see. But it's important to note that, uh, as you've mentioned, the confessional system is by itself almost imposed a deadlock, structural deadlock, uh, that uh, enables only a certain degree of uh, maneuvering because of the existence of the blocks um, that cannot really uh, 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 create a, 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 a real uh, revolution or kick, uh, let's say, one of the blocks, let's say, Hezbollah block, really, uh, uh, outside of the system. Uh, Dr. Maria, you've been, uh, one may say, intimately involved with uh, one uh, important component of the um, uh, Lebanese society, and that is the Christian, and within the Christian, the Maronite, and the, within the Maronite community, the Lebanese forces, the Falange, the um, uh, Jamail family. Um, yes. Have they uh, lost their status now? What, what is their relative position? 
Well, the, the problem of the Christian camp in Lebanon is its division. I mean, it, it has always been uh, uh, that way. Uh, tri it, it's a tribal uh, society, you know, the, the, uh, in villages that are neighboring villages. If, if a village is attacked, the other village will not run to the, to the rescue. This is the way le the Lebanese believe. So you have the Maronites, but the Maronites are divided upon themselves. You have the Orthodox, you have the, the other Catholics, and then you have the Armenians. You have all, the, you, you have, uh, I would say, a melange, incredible, and everybody is fighting everybody. So the Lebanese forces are fighting the Falange, the Falange are fighting the Marada, the Marada are fighting the, 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 the Tashnak, and the Tashnak, Tashnak is the Armenian, and there are the, the two Armenians camp. So the, I would say that there's no solidarity in the Christian camp. Add to it the fact that the Christians are the, the responsible of their, their situation today. These were the, 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 the was it was the Christians. It was the the, uh, the Maronite uh, patriarch Hoyek who asked in 1920 to uh, the French to add to Lebanon to Mount Lebanon to add the Bekaa, the north and Beirut and and the south of Lebanon, creating a, a situation where the Maronite were used to be 95 percent of the population fell to 50%, and today they're, le they're less than that, and this is the, the, the source of the problem in Lebanon, the division, the confessionalism, and the sectarian between the different parties. This is d deeply rooted in, the, uh, in Lebanese politics. Lebanon has never been never been stable. If you look at, the, uh, at, at its history, modern history, uh, in 56, the, the problems, 58, the first uh, uh, civil war, 1975, second civil war, till 1983. Uh, 80, 83 again, the, uh, after the Israeli withdrawal, another the civil war, and it ended in, in Taif trying to rebalance the situation in Lebanon, and the, the, uh, the parliament was, in fact, the mirror of this compromise. There used to be six Christians for five Muslims, and, and now there are six, six Muslims for six Christians, but this formula is, I'd say, is worn out, is forgotten, and Hezbollah, the Shiites, are demanding more than that. Uh, Colonel Ben Shalom, um, how big a problem militarily is Lebanon for Israel? Um, and the question um, is focused on the fact that there is no center of gravity. There is no one power, one lever which you can push or pull, and then decisions are made so that uh, a ceasefire is reached and uh, territorial demands are settled. Um, as, as a military organization, how does the IDF view such a country where most of the threats towards Israel used to come from the southern part. But now, with rockets, uh, with uh, a range of, of uh, hundreds of kilometers, it doesn't matter. Well, warfare is changing everywhere. We see it in Russia, we see it in Syria, and we see it certainly in Lebanon. For us, mainly the issue of precision munitions, and of course the strong backing of Iran, and that Hezbollah is in a way a forward operating base of Iran. So that's the tragedy that our, our neighbors to the north, in a way, are an Iranian stronghold. And for us, we don't see it as one country or one entity, but, you know, as a, as a whole map where we have uh, mainly Iran as our main rival, threatening our very existence, operating and f funding and training Hezbollah and Hamas. So Lebanon, as Lebanon, the country, all we would want to do is live in peace and quiet. We have, of course, no territorial demands, no disputes. Uh, some invented by the Lebanese, but that's ridiculous. So we, so we really just have this agenda of Hezbollah that is arming themselves uh, uh, really in a way that's turning into a significant force. So I think today the IDF looks at Hezbollah as a, as a serious rival with very good uh, capabilities. That's one of the reasons why Israel is continuously thwarting these capabilities even before they reach their hands. As far as the next round with, or, you know, I say round because that's what we call it, the next war in Lebanon, it probably won't even be a war with Lebanon, but an arena or an entire regional war where they will be the main rival. Uh, it will be a huge tragedy for Lebanon once again, because, again, I think if Hezbollah would, would, uh, would uh, let go of these, these foolish aspirations of clashing with Israel, Lebanon would benefit. And as long as they lead them into conflict, Lebanon will be in, in a terrible, terrible situation after the next clash. As far as being a, uh, an existential threat for Israel, that's not the issue at all. We can cope with them, we can deal with them, but it's, it's, we're doing it already now as we speak. 
And our discussions with the Lebanese are mainly in roundabout ways. We have the trilateral discussions with, uh, with uh, UNIFIL and uh, the Lebanese armed forces. And all we can do to stabilize the place, very important American presence there and assistance. And of course, we're all for stability and peace. Uh, Dr. Bams, um, there's been a lot of uh, popular anger following um, corruption, the collapse of uh, the economy, that uh, very little uh, blast at the uh, port of Beirut in August of 2020. But the elite uh, seems uh, quite resistant to these pressures. How can outside forces, such as the International Monetary Fund, which demands reforms as um, uh, um, a condition for its uh, assistance, or uh, France, or the United States. How can they help democracy thrive in Lebanon and hopefully uproot the corrupt elite? Well, Amir, this is the exact question that they're asking. Uh, the IMF, uh, the World Bank, and I actually had a chance to speak uh, with some of the representatives uh, actually very recently are asking themselves how can they do it and how can they make sure that when they uh, give uh, uh, assistance uh, and implement uh, programs and, and that are now uh, again extremely needed uh, with a country that is on uh, almost be really beyond the verge of uh, bankruptcy uh, how can they uh, ensure uh, that uh, that money is not going to go to waste uh, to be honest with you i'm not sure that they have the answer because they understand uh, that the confessional system and the corrupt system and the fact that you have uh, uh, interests that are stakeholder related and other than national interest actually helps create this corruption. Eventually you need uh, uh, some, uh, if, if, if Hezbollah uh, uh, controls a certain piece of it, they want to make sure that the money will flow uh, to their programs, not necessarily to that program of Lebanon. I mean, otherwise, how can you create uh, a, a militia that is actually militarily uh, is stronger and sometimes even from a budgetary perspective is stronger than the state that's supposed to host it. Uh, and, and that uh, paradox uh, uh, exists in a number of other fields. Um, in order to uh, fix it, really, you need to fix it from the core. It's not just a matter of having reforms. You really need to uh, restructure the entire political system, something that is probably not possible to do. And what had happened in, uh, in the past is that a lot of assistance that was given, including uh, uh, that went through uh, the uh, Lebanese uh, central bank, uh, eventually did not improve uh, Lebanon uh, liquidity. And if you're looking again at the issue of today, at the elections, remember that every candidate needs to deposit $5,000 uh, in order to become a candidate. In a country that uh, where the banks don't really function, very few people are actually able to do it, and therefore even them need to be supported by outside forces or outside uh, uh, stakeholders who are able to help them do that. And therefore, you know, there goes democracy because the only people who are able to become candidates are those able to get the support of a bloc uh, and and another uh, outside party uh, that be, that is able to use and abuse. Uh, the very fragile uh, uh, political and, and financial uh, uh, situation. Uh, so this question remains unresolved. Uh, and I think the World Bank uh, hesitates. I think it also believes the IMF recently says that they'll have to go in. There is no other choice. And they will uh, uh, seek to implement some degrees of reforms. Uh, although I do not have high hopes uh, that uh, these uh, reforms will uh, really clear in the system. What is Lebanon needs for that uh, is something much more deep uh, that, uh, that deals with its own political infrastructure uh, and political foundation upon uh, its stands. Jacques, let's uh, uh, turn to three Ps, presidential position and personalities. Uh, the current president, retired uh, General Michel Aoun, uh, is supposed to end his term uh, later this year. And uh, the president is being elected, of course, by parliament rather than uh, by popular uh, voters. And, um, of course, in 1982, the coming uh, election uh, to uh, succeed Elias Sarkis was uh, part of the reason, at least for the timing of the Israeli uh, war in Lebanon, which was uh, intended to uh, get Bashir Jumail elected. Um, but right now, it seems as if the uh, president uh, is not uh, that all important in uh, Lebanese politics. Um, 
it, of course, the president is always a Christian, uh, with the speaker being a Shiite, Nabi Berry, for the last uh, three decades already, and the prime minister being uh, a Sunni. Um, what can we expect uh, in the run-up to the presidential elections? Well, first, we have, uh, the, we have to answer the question, uh, what will be the outcome of the legislative uh, the elections? And in my view, we are heading into a, a, a dead end because uh, the, uh, the, in the Christian camp, there's definitely a weakened, a weakened uh, uh, Basile. I mean, the, the, the son-in-law, the uh, Michel Aoun's son-in-law, who heads the free patriotic movement, is losing, is losing its, uh, its audience at the expense of the Lebanese forces. And if this happens, it means, it could mean that Hezbollah would not be able to form a majority. If he hasn't a majority, then you don't have a parliament. And if you don't have a parliament, you cannot vote for a president. The president ends his term on 20, 22nd October. It will be six years, five years, and 364 days, because on the 665th day, he has to leave. But in fact, because of this, uh, the, the, this dead end, it could be, there could be a situation where there could be an extension of, uh, and it, this has been done in the past, of the presidential term for a certain period of time. And uh, if you look at who are the potential candidates, you have one uh, is Jibran Basile. He is the son-in-law of the, the president, and he is on the uh, on the sanction list, on the U.S. sanction list. And then you have Michel, you have Samir Jaja, who is, uh, who is looked at as a pro-Israeli and as an Israeli agent. Then you have Nadim Jmail, who is who has no power in the Falange. And then you have Suleiman Frangir, the head of the Marada, who has only two votes at the, in the parliament. And he is linked with Hezbollah and with Syria. The, uh, the answer today is who could be the next president? It is, we're talking about Joseph, uh, Joseph Aoun, the head, the, the, the chief of the army, who is a pro-American and he is pampered and pushed today by the Americans and trying to put him as a possible candidate. But according to the, uh, the, the situation today, we are heading into a dead end. And I think that, this, that these elections would be where you will see most violence and vote buying that you have never seen in Lebanon. You will see the, uh, the voting polls that do not fun function, and you will have results that you, everybody will claim that these are not the right results. So we are heading into a stagnation and a paralysis of the system. Joseph Aoun is not a relative of Michel Aoun, or at least not. No, not uh, at all. Um, Only the and, name is the same. Right, and and um, like uh, Michel Aoun and uh, Michel Suleiman and uh, Fuad Shihab, he is a, a general, and this is um, a one um, a place where uh, presidents come from um, in uh, Lebanon. Which leads me, uh, Ruben, to to another question regarding the Lebanese uh, armed forces, and they are the darling of the American administration. Uh, for some reason, uh, perhaps uh, more because of hope than reality, that they will uh, counterbalance Hezbollah and um, uh, have some authority over what is happening in Lebanon in general and in southern Lebanon uh, in particular. Is there any chance for the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces, to succeed in that? No. Next. No, this is... Uh Lebanese armed forces are no match to Hezbollah, absolutely no power in the south, not politically, not militarily. There's this Western, uh, you know, dream always that, you know, we'll support these and we'll build these mechanisms. We saw similar uh, uh, dreams or maybe aspirations with the establishment of UNIFIL, uh, that the West maybe believes that uh, an entity like this, they'll go in and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll clean up Lebanon, they'll monitor Hezbollah, they'll disarm Hezbollah. Of course, that wasn't their mandate, that's not even their, their ability because they're, they're weak. And if they try to raise their head, they're hit on the head. Lebanese armed forces, again, that we are engaged in some kind of roundabout dialogue with them, respect them. The Americans try to support them, but I think it's just to keep their head above the water. Uh, so these are more like Western aspirations to keep some kind of stability. Lebanese, in my view, is Hezbollah militarily. Hezbollah is the strong power in the region, which means it's a, an Iranian stronghold, and that's the way to see it. And I, don't see, and I don't see anything in this next election stabilizing that, on the contrary. 
Jacques, uh, Reuven just used the term uh, keeping their heads above the water. Perhaps the solution is below the water, in the Mediterranean, in uh, the resources, the uh, gas, uh, which is awaiting a compromise between Israel and Lebanon. Perhaps uh, it will not only help the Lebanese economy, but also will give it and Hezbollah a stake in keeping peace and quiet. Compromise. Who would compromise? You're talking about Hezbollah, who's blocking all the, the negotiations with Israel. He has, uh, he has said that definitely there will be no the, no the, 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 the limitation of, board, uh, of uh, maritime borders between Lebanon and Israel, because it would be as if we are recognizing uh, the enemy, we are recognizing Israel. So this is uh, this is one of the of the policies, uh, part of the policies of Hezbollah. Hezbollah has uh, uh, in its program one only item, and the item is how to transform Lebanon into the next uh, Islamic Republic, part of the Islamic Republic of Iran under the Valid uh, Valid Fakir, the Iranian Iran Fakir. This is what they want to do. They've been saying that since 1985, and this is they, they have been very constant in their in their dream and their vision. So this is what we are talking about. We are not talking about, uh, you're talking about the Lebanese army. What Lebanese army? You have hundreds, thousands of Lebanese soldiers who have left the army, but deserted the army because the, the salary there, are, the, it, it's a mockery. The salaries today of most of the Lebanese army is paid by the United States and by the by, by donor countries. They are, they, they do, they, they're initiating helicopter trips of $150 in order to, to, uh, to bring money into their coffers. This is what what we have: the Lebanese army who is who is waiting for food that is coming from outside. Can this compete with Hezbollah? Hezbollah is paying 150 dollars per month for each of its soldier, for its combatant, and this is a lot of money. Lebanon. Jacques Neria, Nir Bombs, and Ruben Ben Shalom. I hoped for an optimistic outlook for Lebanon, but obviously I was too optimistic. Thank you all, and we'll be back for another edition of Jerusalem Studio from Jerusalem.